It's Thursday, July 15th. They've been encouraging kids to get vaccinated for years, and then COVID hit. We start here. As coronavirus cases multiply in the South, scientists worry that anti-vaxxer sentiment is becoming policy. We were told that we were no longer to do any kind of vaccine outreach whatsoever to adolescents. A former Tennessee official now says she was fired for encouraging young people to get their shot. We'll talk to her. Did Iran just try to kidnap an American journalist? Force her on to a boat? The extraordinary claims from the Justice Department of a black ops mission. And being a parent is a thankless job, but it's about to pay more than it used to. Parents will get either $250 or $300 each month, depending on the child's age. The child tax credit just expanded, so how soon could you get a check? From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. In many parts of the country, we are way past the days of having field hospitals for COVID patients. Those days where hospital staff just couldn't keep up with the flood of people begging for help. That's gone. Except in places like Little Rock, Arkansas. They're in the hospital on oxygen. About half are in the ICU. About half of them are on ventilators. In this medical center, every ICU bed is full. Same in Springfield, Missouri. The fear is that we have not seen the the peak of the surge yet. And in the state of Tennessee, hospitalizations are up 43% since the July 4th holiday. The thing connecting many of these areas are low vaccination rates. That's it. In some cases, less than one in four adults are vaccinated. Why didn't you trust that? I just went on my own belief and like, you know, I'm going to let it do what it, you know, let it do what it do. And, you know, I just have to deal, you know, with the consequences. And if that's the case, because people just will not be convinced no matter what happens, well, okay. But experts say that's not how this works. In areas where people get information from scientists, they have a better shot at staying safe. In places where politics enters the equation, they don't. Some say to remove Dr. Fiskus is purely political, accusing Republicans and Governor Bill Lee of trying to find a scapegoat for anti-vaccine legislatures. And in Tennessee, the top vaccine official in the state recently said she was fired because she was too publicly supportive of people getting a COVID shot. And we got her with us this morning. Dr. Michelle Fiskus is a pediatrician, and until recently, she was the medical director for vaccine preventable diseases and immunization programs at the Tennessee Department of health. Dr. Fiscus, I mean, can you just, first of all, give us the ground level view of the COVID situation in Tennessee? Where are we right now? Well, there's a lot of angst around the Delta variant for sure. You know, we have um, a high number of border states. We have eight border states and two of those are Missouri and Arkansas. And they have seen this influx of cases of Delta variant COVID-19. Mississippi now is seeing um, some very severe um, child infections. So there's a lot of angst here as our border states start to see increasing cases. The race to get the shots into arms of Tennesseans before the Delta COVID-19 strain spreads is ongoing. The Delta variant is more contagious. It's more likely to be spread among folks who are not vaccinated. We have one of the lowest vaccination rates in the country. Only 38 percent of our population is fully vaccinated at this point. Um, And that's not because there's been a lack of access of vaccines. It's not because we haven't had enough time to vaccinate them. It's because people are not showing up to get vaccinated. Right. Which brings us then to your termination, right? Like you're no longer employed by the Tennessee Department of Health. How were you let go? Like what what happened here? I actually wasn't told the the reason why I was fired. Um, I got an email that um, said to come uh, to a a certain conference room for a meeting that was described as miscellaneous with the um, the uh, chief medical officer of the state and a member of the human resources department at TDH and was provided two options. Um, One was a letter of resignation that had been written for me that was awaiting my signature. The other was a letter um, explaining that my executive service had expired and I was um, allowed to choose between those two options. And I chose uh, to have my um, my executive service expire because I, I really have no reason to um, to resign from this position. 
Well, and so they didn't tell you why they fired you. And you've said that, you know, despite the state's low vaccination numbers, that, that everyone in government had been pretty impressed and happy with the way the Department of Health had been handling this, that you yourself had sort of been singled out for praise before. So why do you think you got fired? Like, do you have a sense of what did it? Well, the um, the, the first thing was uh, a memo that I sent out to COVID-19 vaccine providers in the state who had been asking um, what to do if a minor shows up and wants to be vaccinated and they're not accompanied by a parent. The memo that was sent out by our vaccine program director was uh, in response to a lot of questions that we had gotten from providers. And um, I wasn't exactly sure what to tell them, so I reached out to our Office of General Counsel. They provided me with the language of the mature minor doctrine in Tennessee, which uh, was actually decided by the Tennessee Supreme Court in 1987, so 34 years ago. Um, and that determined that children age 14 and older, if it's determined by their health care provider that they seem mature enough to make the decision, can seek health care without the, um, the consent of their parents. So what this doctrine does is it is an allowance. It's not a requirement. It's an allowance. I um, was told that the, the information that was sent to me was publicly facing. It was posted to the TDH website. It was blessed by the governor's office and that I could share it as I saw fit. I put it out into a memo. Um, and in your mind, but, you're just like, like you're asking, here's the answer. Supreme Court says 14 year old kids can. Yeah, they can. Yeah, go yep. for it. There you go. Here's the rule. Um, so I, I copied and pasted it into a memo. I started it out with with Pfizer vaccine becoming available for 12 and older. I thought it would be helpful to have an understanding of the Tennessee mature minor doctrine. That memo went out. Um, someone was unhappy with it. It ended up being posted to um, social media. People started calling their legislators to complain. And so we appreciate you being here today. And I know many people here have received many calls from across the state. And then we, the Department of Health, was called before the State Government Operations Committee. I don't know how the terms that I could use to express my extreme disappointment in the state of Tennessee, where the majority of the adults said no, to think that a 14-year-old child could say yes. A legislature there called for the dissolution of the Tennessee State Department of Health mm. as a result of um, this memo having been put out. She may have not have said, go ahead and vaccinate these kids, but boy, she sure gave the roadmap on how to do it and get around it with the law. After that, it became apparent that Department of Health leadership was, was quite concerned about those threats. Um, we were told that we were no longer to do any kind of vaccine outreach whatsoever to adolescents, um, that we could know we, we had to cancel events that were planned to um, vaccinate children if, if they were occurring at schools or um, outside of the Department of Health. There couldn't be any vaccine uh, or adolescent specific events that were being held to vaccinate them. And this is for um, COVID, like like if there's a COVID vaccine, like don't you don't need to tell them, tell their parents about it. Right. Initially. And then it, it very quickly devolved into don't message vaccines for children at all. So wow. even to their parents. And that's all vaccines. Not only to 12 year olds, they want to take it down to six month olds. Don't do it, y'all. Something must be done. My child will never be vaccinated without my consent. So here we are back to school. Um, we start school in about three weeks in Tennessee. We're 30,000 doses of measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine behind from last year from kids who didn't get vaccinated because of the pandemic. We have kindergartners that are required to have vaccines for school start, seventh graders who have requirements. We're not permitted to message to those parents that their children might be missing vaccines. We were not, uh, we were told we were not permitted to acknowledge that August is National Immunization Awareness Month, where we do a lot of outreach and awareness around the importance of vaccines. And they even went so far as to tell our health departments that if they had events scheduled for flu vaccine next fall, that they were to go ahead and cancel those events that were you know, traditionally held in schools um, because there was not to be any vaccination of children outside of the Department of Health or at any facility that primarily um, works with children. Well, and so that leads me to my last question. Just as a doctor, then forget forget your former title, right? Just as a pediatrician, as a doctor, what goes through your mind as you watch these vaccination rates flatline and these hospitalizations go up? 
Um, so it's, it's sadness, it's frustration, it's, it's fear. Um, we know the, the Delta variant is bearing down on us. Our case numbers have gone up 400% in the last couple of weeks. Um, we have seen what, um, what Arkansas and Missouri uh, and now Mississippi are going through. Um, and it's, it's, it's so um, surreal because, you know, part of me wants to say, have you never watched a disaster movie? Have you never seen the movie where the scientists are telling you the asteroid is going to crash into the earth and all the politicians are swirling around and ignoring them and spinning things for, you know, however they want them spun? We are going to have a surge. We're already seeing it. Um, this Delta variant comes on fast. And we've already seen a tremendous increase in numbers and more people are going to die from a disease that is almost 100% preventable at this point. And we're going to see people continue to die. Right. In the meantime, we actually contacted the Tennessee Department of Health. They would not comment on the termination. Like you said, they said they do understand the importance of childhood immunizations and their impacts to overall health for Tennesseans. They say they continue that outreach and that they're among the top states in vaccinations for other diseases among children. They say, though, that they want to remain a trustworthy source of information. And in many ways, a trustworthy messenger means that they have to keep in mind hesitancy in this intense national conversation that is affecting how families see the issue. Uh, Dr. Michelle Fiscus, formerly of that Tennessee Department of Health. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Brad. I appreciate it. Next up on Start Here, she's an American citizen living in America, and yet Iranians were getting a boat ready to ferry her out of the country. The bizarre allegations after the break. The noise level in politics can be overwhelming. That's why the team at 538 relies on data and evidence to get a deeper understanding of what Americans are thinking and whether politicians are being responsive to Americans. So every Monday and Thursday, they dig into questions like, how are young people or cities changing our politics? Why is the Midwest growing more Republican while the South is getting more Democratic? And what does it all mean for who will hold power in Washington? It's a great listen. Tune into the 538 Politics podcast every Monday and Thursday. That's 538. The numbers, spell them out, 538 Politics, every Monday and Thursday, wherever you get your podcasts. There's a reason why the bad guys in movies are always trying to flee the country, because unless the U.S. has a formal extradition treaty with another nation, we're pretty limited in how to get that person back. Same goes for the other countries. In general, you're very constrained by your physical borders. And you can see why that's the case, right? What we consider a crime might not be recognized in another part of the world, and what some dictatorship overseas sees as a crime might not be something we want to enforce for them here. That seemed to change with the death of Jamal Khashoggi when a Saudi journalist was killed by Saudi black ops in Turkey. The Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, approved the brutal execution. We know that Russia has poisoned enemies in countries abroad. Authorities in Belarus actually had a flight diverted to snatch a person they deemed a criminal out of the sky. But would a country try that with the U.S.? Come into our country and try to drag someone out, kicking and screaming to theirs. We're going to turn now to an alleged kidnapping plot for Iranian operatives charged with targeting a U.S.-based journalist. Well, now the U.S. government has announced that's exactly what Iran intended to do. ABC's chief global affairs correspondent Martha Raddatz is with us. And Martha, this was just revealed. What do we know? It's really an extraordinary plot outlined by the Justice Department. They say four Iranian intelligence officers. Now, they are presumably in Iran using people here to carry out this plot. The FBI, like eight months ago, came to my house in Brooklyn and they told me that this house is not safe. Have been watching an author and a journalist who lives in Brooklyn is an American citizen. And then later they came. They showed me photos from my private life, the photos of my husband, me walking around, like watering my beautiful garden. Been watching her have live video feeds on her house in Brooklyn and and were planning on kidnapping her. When I was in the safe house, they asked me to go live on Instagram without mentioning where I was, just saying that I'm out of town, I'm not in Brooklyn. And then they came back to me and they said, yes, they find they found out where you uh, you were. So the- Even using a speedboat, those military style speedboats, getting her out of New York 
and down into Venezuela, where, of course, Venezuela is friends with Iran, and then Iran could take her over to Iran. Wait, so literally, like, not just some, like, lure her somewhere else, but literally, like, force her out onto a boat and just try to outrun American authorities? Absolutely. Force her on to a boat, if that's the plot they decided on. I mean, they had several different plots cooked up to try to get her out of the country. There were other plots. Could they lure her uh, to Turkey? Could they tell her a family member was in trouble? Some way they could get her out of the U.S. and then forcibly return her to Iran because she is an outspoken critic of Iran. I was, like, shocked. I couldn't believe it that the Islamic Republic actually is there that close to me. I know that this is the, is the nature of the Islamic Republic, but I always thought that here in America, in New York, I'm safe. She has family origins in Iran, but she is, again, an American citizen. And this was going to be carried out on American soil. Did they catch the guys or did they just find out about the plot? They, they found out about the plot. They're, they're not going to catch these four Iranian intelligence officials. They are surely in Iran right. uh, directing all of this, according to the Justice Department. But there was an Iranian living in California who they have charged in this indictment, a woman they say was providing some sort of financial services. That woman, if convicted, obviously could very well serve a long prison sentence. And so what does this journalist do in the meantime? And I guess what does the Biden administration do with Iran? (sighs) Her name is Masai Alinejad, and she is now protected or was protected by the police. She she has a very active Twitter account and and said that the police outside uh, are protecting her. You can you can see the lights in the background. Biden's administration actually said that this is a law enforcement. This is not a law enforcement, and it breaks my heart. And she told us, you cannot downplay the level of the brutality of the Islamic Republic just because you want a nuclear deal with them. This is not a law enforcement. This is called hostage taking. This is called kidnapping. This is a real threat. And what kind of impact, if any, will this have on Iranian nuclear talks? Well, it still remains. Uh, we, are, we, we have never assessed Iran to be a good actor in the world. Um, and I think that really is going to become an issue. Uh, the White House has condemned what they call this dangerous and despicable reported plot to kidnap her. But at the same time, we still see it in U.S. interests and in our national interest to engage in ongoing discussions so that we have can have greater visibility into Iran's path to acquiring a nuclear weapon. But so, they say those negotiations will go on. If you don't take an action, then the second victim is going to be you. Any of you from any country. This is not just a bizarre uh, thing that somebody thought up. This very well could have claimed her life. Wow, Martha Rad, it's fascinating and, and scary. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Rad. Yesterday, President Biden met with congressional Democrats to talk about a gigantic spending bill that would cover everything from infrastructure to climate change to drug prices and immigration reform if they can hit 50 votes in the Senate. We're going to get this done. We are getting this done. Thank you. We're told that in the room, despite concerns about striking a deal where Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema and Bernie Sanders can all agree, one senator told us, quote, it was a freaking love fest among the Democrats. And this would follow, remember the president's last big accomplishment, the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan, which was lauded by progressives as not just a COVID stimulus, but perhaps the most consequential strike on child poverty in a generation. Thanks to the American Rescue Plan, we're on track to cut child poverty in America in half this year. One of the big reasons for that was this expanded child tax credit. That's the money that you get knocked off your taxes for the simple act of being a parent in this country to a child. Well, under that Democratic bill that passed this spring, the child tax credit is being expanded in a big way, and it takes effect today. So let's forget about the D's and the R's and all the politics for a second. Let's just focus on what this huge policy change will actually mean for you and your family starting right now. ABC's Katie Kindlin has been studying the ins and outs of the law itself. And Katie, first of all, it's a tax credit. Why is it taking effect two months after tax day? Who would get affected by that? The reason we're talking about this today, Brad, is that today, July 15th, is the day that 
parents across the country are going to start seeing um, some extra money in their bank accounts and um, coming through via mail. I'm announcing today that on July 15th and the 15th of every month thereafter throughout the year, you will get deposited in your bank account half of your tax cut at least. Congress and President Biden essentially decided to start giving money to parents in the same way that they spend it. So now instead of parents getting a lump sum when they file their taxes at the end of the year, they're they're going to start getting it monthly. And so that's the you know really neat thing about this too, is that parents don't have to do anything. Um, if they filed their taxes, they will get these new child tax credits and they'll be um, you know deposited or mailed to them in the same way as the tax returns. Well, so obviously, like it only applies to parents. Right? The benefits start phasing out if your income is over 150 k. But there are a lot of parents in this country. A lot of parents making less than that. So, how does this actually affect families, parents, and children around the country? Well, it's going to, um, you know, like we said, start putting money into their pockets immediately, and so that's going to help with, you know, the everything from diapers to food to clothing. The things that parents know very well come up um, every single week, every single month. Right. Now I can afford to send her to school or to daycare for five days instead of just the three days that she was going. Parents will get either $250 or $300 each month, depending on the child's age. And it, of course, depends on how much um, money is coming into your household. So if um, depending on whether you're married or single and how much money you're making, um, that's how they're going to decide how much money you get. The child tax credit has been around for years, with families receiving $2,000 a year. But an expanded version included in the American Rescue Plan bumps this amount to $3,000 or $3,600, depending on income and the age of children. These well, can we talk about not just the expenses of raising a child, but specifically for low-income families in this country? President Biden said this could cut child poverty in half. That's a big statement. Why does this affect low-income families so specifically? Uh, remember, Brad, there are thousands of families across the country who uh, don't even make enough money to file taxes. So that's how, and under this plan, they are now eligible. Even if they haven't filed taxes, they can uh, receive these child tax benefits. And so that's going to make a huge impact for them. The money will go towards her children's education expenses, as well as dental work and car repair costs. We'll be able to pay that off. And we'll be able to, like, put that money aside for the benefit of our children. And for people who are in that category who have not filed taxes, what they will do is go to the IRS website, irs.gov, and there's a tool, an easy online tool there where they can put in their information and then they'll start getting the tax credits automatically, just like everyone else. Well, OK, and so bottom line, then, how does this change how families plan their, you know, their finances for the next year? Like, Because this is not a permanent thing, we should say. Yeah, and that's a really important thing to remember. These um, expanded tax credits and the monthly payments only last through December. So this is a temporary um, increase. And the other really important thing for parents to remember is the saying there's no such thing as free money. So if they're getting the monthly tax payments now, they're going to get less at the end of the year when they file their taxes. So that's something important for families to know and to plan for. And there's also an option for parents um, if they don't want to receive the payments this new way, they can opt out and they can just go onto the IRS website once, opt out for the rest of the year, and they'll get the lump sum at the end of the year as usual. And then you get your big refund. Although, like economists have said, this is giving people money the way they spend it, which they said is fundamentally different from a family taking a trip or something, actually gives them more money to change their situation throughout the year. Big deal here. Katie Kindlin, thank you so much. Thank you, Brad. Okay, we're going to take another quick break. But when we come back, I'll take story time with George Stephanopoulos for 500, please. One last thing is next. It's time to enjoy the view wherever the day takes you. Come on now. Have no fear. The view girls are here. The biggest names, unafraid to share their views and hold nothing back. We talk about themes on this show that people don't talk about. And now, ABC's The View is available as a podcast with Whoopi, Joy, Sarah, Sunny, Megan, and Dana. This is going to be good. Enjoy The View podcast. Listen for free on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app every weekday afternoon. And one last thing, lots of people have dreams of being a game show contestant, but the way cooler job is a game show host. This is Jeopardy! Here and my first question, George, like, be honest, how many of these clues did you know the answer to already? Come on. Fewer than I expected. Here is the guest host of Jeopardy! George 
Stephanopoulos. That is ABC's own George Stephanopoulos, who's appearing all this week as a guest host on Jeopardy, which means I got to ask him all the questions I've always wanted a game show host to dish. It was really something, you know, they give you this huge spreadsheet the night before after the day of the rehearsal to kind of look at overnight so you can internalize all of the clues. And, like a spreadsheet uh, where it has like the number, like the dollars and the clues? All, all the clues written out so you can keep practice reading them. Right. And they actually said, keep it in the safe of the hotel overnight. That's the paranoid. <gasps> They are wow. not, you know, losing any uh, security for for the clues. Welcome, welcome, welcome as Jeopardy begins its 37th season of original quiz programming. Throughout his time on Jeopardy, the late Alex Trebek had a system. Instead of contestants staying in hotel rooms for insane amounts of time, Trebek would just tape five episodes, a full week of shows, all in one day. So welcome Jen, Jacqueline, and Tim. Let's get right into Jeopardy round with these categories. And so now, guest hosts like George are held to the same standard. This cool admonition to calm down has been paired with Netflix. It's the geographic area of Twilight Man is a graphic novel biography about this writer and Tim. Who is Roberto Clemente? That is correct. And now it's time for a commercial. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back. The other thing about this show, this show moves. That well, and that's what I've always wondered is like. Like, for example, I, I've always wanted to ask somebody, do you get to do takes, like retakes? If you mess if you mess up a pronunciation, do they let you go back? I gave this away on, on GMA the other day, but next time you watch Jeopardy, uh huh, watch how much time you actually see the host on camera. It's not much. <laughs> At the very beginning of the show, and it's when he or she is talking to the contestants, and it's in Final Jeopardy. That is because if the host, and we all do, screws up a clue, you go back and redo it again and again and again. Which actually kind of makes me feel better. Like, why should the contestants suffer through every guest host trying to pronounce, well, you say it, George. A pistol-wielding panda adorns the cover of this bestseller about the importance of proper punctuation. But there's one part of the show you really can't rehearse for, the interviews with the contestants. The interviews you do with players to me, that was almost delightfully painful when Alex Trebek would do it. But like you interview people all day. What was it like to interview people, but oh, but to know you only got 30 seconds or whatever? Delightfully painful. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, it's, it's so awkward. Come on. <laughs> These people are nervous. All they want to do is play the game and become a champion. You're also a costume fan? I am. Uh, You're bringing up these ridiculous budget. facts about their lives. They know they're ridiculous. So I have this closet that's full of old costumes down. My, my fiance has always been trying to get rid of a few of them. It's but so incredibly awkward. And it all has to be done in a lot less than 30 seconds. But luckily, what better role model to have than Alex Trebek himself, who George got to speak with throughout his tenure? Again and again and again. It was his mantra. It's not about the host. It's about the game. I'm just shocked it worked with George specifically because he likes asking questions. Like, that's his whole gig. So that really could have messed with the format. He is on the rest of this week hosting. Robin Roberts is actually hosting next week. I will be jealously watching both of them the entire time. More on all these stories at abcnews.com or the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source.